Hello again, everyone. Uh, this is going to be your second video on Mary Pfeiffer's The Middle of Everywhere. Uh, this video will be shorter as it sort of extends on what was discussed in the last video. Uh, for this week, you'll be looking at the second half of the book, and you do, in fact, have a writing assignment that responds to your reading, not only from this week, but if you want to pull some things out of last week, that would certainly be appropriate. Uh, as I said in your video last week, and in the email that followed, it's not necessary to try and encompass everything that you read and represent it in your one to two page uh, response. Uh, the best strategy to do this would be to hit on something, a question you had, a point of interest or a quote, even something that Piper or any of our authors brings up. Sit on that, really contemplate it, pour into it some, and then maybe try to make some connections to other parts of her reading or things that I may have said uh, in your uh, video here. Or if there are relevant current events issues that come up, uh, you can make those connections as well. So uh, just rest assured that you're not supposed to be trying to represent all of the reading in one particular reading uh, response assignment. Uh, that said, I'll also be talking... Uh, in a video probably later this week about your upcoming uh, assignments, the current events responses. Uh, I'll save that for its own video and give you a little bit of a layout on how I want you to do that, maybe a little bit more explanation than what's in the syllabus. Okay, we're keeping along. We're week three beginning uh, this week. So uh, this video, as I said, will be sort of short, extending on the things we looked at last week and hopefully leading you towards a, uh, a good possible discussion for reading response this week. So Pfeiffer in the second half of the book, remember last week she's very, and she continues this, she's very much driven by anecdotal support for her cultural broker and immigrants in the new world, refugees specifically, situation. She uh, includes many different stories, some elongated, some looking at a family over an entire chapter, some bringing up only incidents here and there. But this is her, her modus operandi, her MO, in terms of making the United States specifically, and the Midwest more specifically, aware of the refugees who are in our uh, immediate surroundings, sort of waking us up. The second half of the book really begins to, to push on that even a little bit more. And by the time she gets towards the end, she begins posing general but sort of direct questions at the reader, asking us to consider uh, what we would do if we were refugees. What would we uh, encounter in our lives? How would we feel differently, etc.? And she... She, even towards the, the last few chapters as she builds toward conclusion, uh, extends this idea that perhaps it would do us some good to imagine ourselves like refugees and not take these things for granted and to recognize that we have an adaptability uh, in, innate within us that we need to tap into at some times. So, in fact, I want to turn first to, to a quote that she gives us from the last few pages of the book. Now, granted, you may or may not have read this far yet, but I'm, I'm going to point you ahead towards uh, the first real move she makes towards concluding. There's the phone again. Great timing all the time. Uh, the first quote I want you to look at is actually on page 319, and it comes under that heading that begins on 318, What Refugees Can Teach Us About Identity. A quick note here about page numbers. If you're not finding the same page numbers I have in this edition of the book, uh, you can sort of m determine where you are by looking in Chapter 11, Home, a Global Positioning System for Identity. Okay, So again, back to 319, and she says this about halfway down the page. To survive in this new century, we all need what refugees need. We must adapt to a world that shifts constantly under our feet. We must be resilient or we will be lost. We need families who love us and will help us, rituals and traditions, in contact with the natural world and with our history. We need communities of friends to hold our lives in place and reasonable conditions in the external world, livable wages, 
decent schools and health care, safe streets and opportunities to advance. And as I read through this doorbell as well, dogs going up the stairs, wonderful time to be making this video. But as I read through this, what, what's uh, sort of rejuvenated in my mind is the, the whole U United Nations Declaration of Human Rights uh, that we read a couple of weeks ago. And we see the things that, that Pfeiffer's pointing out that we, everyday citizens, non-refugees, uh, need to recognize as our similarities to the basic needs that, that refugees encounter. We need to be like refugees and recognizing that all of these things are necessary for each and every one of us to live, not just the refugees who we encounter uh, or don't encounter in particular uh, in, our, in our certain locales. So for her to stress this um, is really a, a prominent sort of underpinning through earlier portions of the book that she spells out for us here. You know, look back and you'll see other examples where she says we could learn from them, right? So much of that cultural broker identity seems, you know, entwined with this idea that we're giving it all to them. We're teaching them. We're helping them adapt. But yet we are receiving, you know, if we're in the right framework of mind, we're receiving something back that is equally as as important and and there are several different examples throughout the book that stress this okay if you flip back a page in fact I'm sorry forward a page 320 she she sort of elaborates on this idea uh, it's the second paragraph on that page this is still under the same heading so she's still getting at the same message uh, the paragraph that begins Aristotle wrote we are what we repeatedly do Excellence is not an act, but a habit. The Dalai Lama said, my religion is kindness. Or as Thomas Paine wrote, my country is the world and my religion is to do good. Moral people tend to have good moral habits and a few simple rules, such as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They are the north stars for the rest of us. They give us hope as we try to orient on our spinning planet. And the idea here, the, the one that she's elaborated on, is that we need to recognize uh, that religions and credos and philosophies and cultures and norms, all these things that we put up as, as barriers towards uh, recognizing the sameness of our identity, all of these things need to be sort of uh, taken down, taken back, right? And, and we recognize that it is sort of much more encompassing, all-encompassing moral sense of right and and duty and responsibility uh, can be laid out in front of us. And those are the people that can recognize what it is to be um, a real citizen of the world, a global uh, identity of citizenship, in fact. Um, this is very, very much the point that she's making in the first half of the book by by letting us see our lives uh, in comparison to the many, many struggles that she portrays, and successes as well. But if we can see ourselves alongside them, maybe our sort of meta understanding of this is to understand that we all have this, this outsiderness, certainly not the exact situations that refugees and immigrants are going through, but, but if we can see ourselves in them, and the fact that we share humanity and we share uh, many of the same goals, we can understand the plight a little bit better, in fact. Now, right, we're, we're not gliding over the fact that they've been through very traumatic, often violent and, and serious situations. We're not gliding over that part, but we're just recognizing that at its base, those people could very well be us, if not for the luck of of geographic displacement, etc. So uh, all of that to say, uh, Pfeiffer is really building towards a sense of, of interaction uh, on a massive level. You know, don't continue this us and them mentality, but instead recognize that, that we are privileged out of luck and chance, and we can extend beyond that privilege to recognize that we are the same in some way. 
One other place that I want to point you to is, is around this same area. It's a little further along, but uh, I want to, to look at this from the flip side, right? Along with recognizing our sameness, recognizing you know, the way that, that immigrants and refugees live their lives in a very different way than we do, uh, is what Pfeiffer lists here, and this is on page 334 in this edition, as something called just plain ignorance. And boy, this is something that she and others have spelled out. She's got a list here uh, that you can look at. If you, if you haven't read that far, you, you can turn to the page now. And what she's laid out for us here are common core identity uh, traits of refugees based on simplistic thinking. Uh, oversimplification of the situation and she calls it JPI or just plain ignorance and if you turn to 334, 335 and all the way on to 336 she lists 10 common beliefs here and what we might do and this may be a sort of soul searching and introspective exercise is recognize how we see ourselves in relation to this individually or perhaps as part of a community, if that community is a family or, or a population of, of your friends or a larger you know, municipal community or regional community, how do we see ourselves in relation to this? Uh, you know, just listing them real quick, I won't read through all the paragraphs. Refugees are ignorant and have no formal education. Two, the United States takes in most of the world's refugees. We'd love to believe that. Three, most refugees are here illegally. Four, newcomers are taking American jobs. Five, newcomers do not pay taxes. Six, tax dollars go to teach refugees in their own languages. Seven, newcomers don't want to learn English. Eight, most refugees end up on welfare. Nine, anyone who wants to can come to America. Boy, that's one of the biggest misconceptions there is. Uh, and number 10, a sort of compartmentalized way of looking at the, the xenophobic nativist mentality expressed in this phrase, why don't they go back where they belong? Okay, And when you get there, when you build up to this section in the reading, you'll see that it comes on the heels, as I said, of recognizing you know, a small portion of us uh, population who recognizes that, that the situations uh, of these poor people are driven by lots and lots of things, parts that Americans and other governments and other privileged peoples throughout the world have, have a part in. Uh, and then she, in the next chapter after that one, where we begin to see how are we like refugees, she lays it out specifically how we often, communally and individually, distance ourselves from refugees. And we, we stereotype and discriminate against them based on these different ingredients of JPI, or just plain ignorance. Um, it's important that we understand that, that there are levels within each of these that, that affect all of us. We all have elements of non-understanding, right? Ignorance, in its most basic definition, is a non-familiarity. We've never learned it. We've never been uh, driven to explore it or to advance our knowledge in that area, so we still possess an ignorance, right? It's not necessarily, though it carries with it, a negative tinge. It's not necessarily a negative thing to call out ignorance, right? Persistent ignorance, you know, or chosen, determined ignorance is something else, right? If we, if we choose to continue as ignorant and not educate ourselves and not make ourselves much more engaged with people and, and other cultures and, and other ways of learning things, etc. That's something much more negative. Okay, Just plain ignorance is something that can be addressed and can be connected. Okay, And so she includes these here, not just to push on and to pick on Americans who sort of shelter themselves in privileged identity, though I think that's part of it. But it's also to recognize the areas in which we lack understanding, the areas of our ignorance, okay? And when you take that ignorance and you propagate it to others, right, and you 
speak of it and you 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 state it as fact and you and you continue the narratives that's you know a disservice to the entirety of of the refugee and immigrant populations so that ignorance is something that we can take head on it's a very crucial way to understand uh, what is at stake in, in creating much more welcoming environment, whether it's here in the Midwest, as she's writing about specifically, or just in the world in general, which she's alluding to by including the Declaration on Human Rights. Okay? If you turn, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit, since we're talking about ourselves, our American uh, reception as a community of refugee and immigrant acceptors, rejectors, and tolerance levels, intolerance levels. I want us to turn back to uh, 285, which is another list. Pfeiffer includes many lists in here, or, or charts, or, or some ways of sort of charting, graphing out particular elements of, of her argument. And the one that I want you to look at here is what she calls on 285, attributes of resilience. Okay, And just looking at that paragraph there, and again, I'm understanding if you haven't read this far yet or if you've completed this last week or, or whatever, I'm just pointing out some of what you will be reading or reminding you some of what you have read here. But on 285, she says, Psychology has documented with great precision all human inadequacies. We have the diagnostic and statistical manual to catalog our problems, but we have no equivalent inventory of human strengths. Writing this book, I discovered certain qualities in resilient people from all over the world, and I labeled them the attributes of resilience. Few refugees had all the attributes, but the ones who were successful at adapting to America had many of them. Those refugees with few or none of the attributes were in a great deal of trouble in America. And I position this here because it actually, if we look at and compare these, these articles uh, uh, or these attributes of resilience with what she later goes on to term the components of just plain ignorance, you can see a way that she's working to correct some of those uh, long-held beliefs, the, the, the narratives of what it means to have and to take in refugees here. Instead, she looks at um, the way that that um, these particular attributes can, in some ways, calculate success or levels of, uh, of assimilation and engagement with, with new environments to a higher degree. And she lists them, and, and she does a, a great deal explaining about how hard or how difficult it is to, to sort of change these things. First one she lists is future orientation on page 286. Ability to understand and to mark out time is a cultural element that sometimes must be navigated quite difficultly for some newly arrived refugees and immigrants. Um, the second one she lists is energy and good health. This is certainly uh, very crucial to refugees and immigrants who oftentimes must make you know, very difficult journeys to, to leave troubled areas. And then once they get to their newly arrived home, they oftentimes live in, in um, much less than desired uh, sorts of habitats, homes where the heat or the air conditioning or other parts um, may not be completely the best of what they're looking for. They oftentimes take on uh, jobs where they work in physically strenuous conditions, all of these things put a strain on their energy and good health. So the better their health and the better their energy level, the more they're going to be able to, to survive here in the United States and in their new home. Uh, number three, on 287, she says the ability to pay attention, right? Obviously, learning and adapting, that takes very studious and very long-standing um, comprehension of general and specific ideas. So paying attention is key. Ambition and initiative, those go on uh, on back to the energy 
idea, this idea that you've got to have a drive, you've got to have a purpose, you have to be able to think about the future, number one, back to that. You've got to understand that, that some of this, a large portion of this, in fact, is going to depend on how much you strive and continue to strive, right? And verbal expressiveness is the next thing. Are you able to communicate? Are you able to interact with your new world or the world that you've, you've uh, been tossed into, perhaps? Positive mental health, this is something that's a little bit more uh, Pfeiffer's forte. She's very much looking, if you remember from last uh, week's video discussion, she's very much looking at the way that the American culture uh, is expressed through people's individual and communal mental health statuses. So if you have a positive mental health, you're in much better shape, okay, for the atrocities and the traumas that are more than likely going to be tossed at you in the refugee immigrant process. So you're going to need to be strong mentally. The ability to calm down, you know, everybody needs that, certainly, but people who are going to be tossed into infuriating red tape situations, bureaucracies, um, situations where uh, non-native speakers of English are going to have to try their best to get along. All of these things require you to have the ability to calm down. Otherwise, what do you look like to them? You look like an irate uh, foreigner who doesn't understand the language and the culture and is is just written off and not um, welcomed, etc. Okay. Number eight on the bottom of 289 is flexibility. You can think about that in a lot of different ways. Certainly the ability to adapt and to move and change schedule and, and work with different people and, and, and all of these things that are not solidified, uh, things that change or pulled out from under your feet at a moment's notice, all of that requires a certain flexibility uh, as well as learning to adapt to where you might be moving in the country. Right? Early in the book she talks about people who were moved to areas of the United States, they had no idea uh, where they were. They had no other friends, no other people from their homeland or their culture or their religion around. And, and it creates a, a need or, or a real uh, necessity to be flexible and to grow and to do your best to adapt to that. Uh, number nine is a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, general intentionality or being thoughtful about choices. Again, this requires thinking long-term, thinking critically, thinking um, about ways to sort of make good decisions. There was an example in the first half of the book where where she visits, I believe it's the, the, the four daughters' homes, and she's noticing that uh, this is the place where she writes that uh, America's Best Minds are writing ad copy, and she's She's discussing the ways that the advertising campaigns and commercials and these sort of things are very much taken to heart by you know, immigrants and refugees who don't understand the language of advertising and the way that this works and credit card applications and all those sort of things. So having a, a, a very critical and thoughtful uh, framework in, in how you think about things is a necessity as well. A 10, she lists, is a, is a very very, um, how do I want to say, emotion-based one, lovability, right? Are you able to create relationships? Are you able to care for others? Are you able to maintain those through hardship and through through pain and, and find other people who will love you for who you are and all of these sort of things? It's a very indefinable quality, but one that she lists here because I think it's important to understand what it means to be able to fit into a community and, and to have a family that fits in along with you. And then she extends this idea number 11 by, by saying the ability to love new people. You know, right? It's one thing for you to, to attract love and to be uh, accepted and to be cared for, but can you do this as well, right? Along with doing all of these other things that you must do in order to succeed in your new country. And then lastly, number 12, on page 292, she says, uh, good moral character. And this is very important in that we need to understand laws, yes, and rules, yes, but also this idea of, of a sense of right and wrong in a morale 
or in a moral sense, right, in the way that the Dalai Lama and Thomas Paine are talking about, we've got to find this this large scale version of what is right and what is wrong amongst all people. And you can find that commonality if you work at it. Now, she lists these here as uh, 12 resilience attributes that refugees and immigrants arriving in new countries, she has, over the years, witnessed different people coming in at different levels in all these categories. And those who have more largely do better, while those who have less may fall into the cracks and not succeed or be forgotten or, or continue to live at a lower status of, of existence in, in the United States. Um, but it, it's also sort of implied here, and tying it back to my earlier discussion about how we can liken ourselves to the refugees in certain situations, we might look at these resilience attributes and understand them as ways to succeed as a human being in the United States. How are we best able to, to measure ourselves in each of these um, attributes? Now, certainly, if we're talking about how we relate to our own hometown, our own home region, our home country, the, the, the scale should go up. We should have more of these than newly arrived immigrants. We should know what it's like to think about the future. We should know who the right people are to talk to about something. We should know uh, when and where we need to devote our energy. All of those things, the bar should be raised for us, but they're very uh, specific attributes that we can measure our own success on, and you know, specifically thinking about the ability to love new people and to create a sense of lovability in ourselves. Um, it's very much a, a, we talked last time, or I talked rather, about culture shock, you know, to refugees and immigrants is very discernible. We can define fairly easily what culture shock means in that way. But for Americans, and this was one of the questions I posed to you last time, for Americans, what does culture shock mean? And does it have something at all to do with recognizing our sense of privilege that we don't deal with a lot of culture shock in our everyday life. Now, a lot of times we've got to, to sort of seek out culture shock on our own. And it's, it's um, again, part of that ignorance package that she talks about, this idea that uh, we have just plain ignorance based on either our choosing or perhaps just our situation, but we can move beyond that. We can move into the different parts of the world, even remaining in the part that we live in. And that's what I think part of her point is. As we close out this book and as we close out this section uh, of the course, I want you to look back and, and, and sort of reconsider that she publishes this book into the 9-11 aftermath, right? And she references that in her prelude and forward. Um, and I want us to think about, you know, this, this generalized fear of difference that she begins the book by saying uh, we have as Americans, a fear of others, a fear of outsiders, and, and not a fear like, yeah, I'm scared of spiders, but, but an unspoken fear in this sense that we don't comprehend and so it perhaps threatens us a little bit. And that's going to carry through throughout this class, whether we're talking immigrant, refugee, or, or migrants from other parts of the country, we're looking at differences coming into contact with one another. And back at, in, in the you know, first part of the 20th century and in the late part of the 19th century, uh, a writing style uh, developed very specifically looking at this, uh, regionalism. Regional writing was very much about uh, cultures coming into contact because movement was much more available uh, in the post-Civil War United States environment with the railroad and with the advancement of other technological innovations. Regions began coming into contact with one another, and so the people who were in these regions were driven to communicate cross-culturally and cross-regionally. And so now we have this on a larger scale. Yes, we've been for many, many, many years and decades and even centuries having cultures come into contact with one another through imagery, 
or immigration and refugee status. But in this this world that we live in now, it seems much more amplified and much more uh, driven by uh, a need to to recognize our own particular self centered privilege. And Pfeiffer's book here at the beginning of our class is is meant to sort of set us up for looking at that that sense of the other, the difference that we are are threatened by or can go out and meet and engage with in a way that suggests we are not as as different. Yes, our experiences are, are oftentimes very different, but we as human beings are not as different in terms of our needs and our desires. And to get past those and recognize our own sort of uh, attributes of, of either resilience or ignorance is part of, a large part, in fact, of Pfeiffer's message in writing this book and in my putting it here, headlining our class as we read forward. Uh, use any of these things, any of these lists, any of these traits that I've brought up. Another place you might look back to is 69 and 70, Traits of Success in America. It's another way that, that Pfeiffer tries to compartmentalize and, and even sort of deconstruct the immigration and refugee experience in the United States. Use any of that to write your reading response to... to find an entry point into Piper's large message and, and speak back to any of these things on on uh, a level either at the front of your response or as a peripheral uh, addendum at the end of your response to something larger. Uh, any of these ways would, would be a, a great approach to doing this reading response. Let me know if you have any questions and I will be back next week with another video.